Thank you. Thanks very much, Harold. No, it's well researched. You, you worked four years. Yeah, I spent a long time right? working on it. It's a huge subject. It's a, in yeah. fact, I thought it was going to be two years. <laughs> so <laughs> I I've know, learned well, how big a subject it was. Unexpected consequences yeah, of yeah. starting something, right? So, yeah, welcome, welcome very much to conversations. Where it's a great pleasure to welcome to the program Jill Andresky Frazier, and she's written a book that we want to highlight right here at the outset, or make, make you aware of right at the outset. It's in the stores now. And let's show the audience how it looks. It's called White Collar Sweatshop. And what's the subtitle, Jill? The Deterioration of Work and Its Rewards in Corporate America. Big subject. Huh? Absolutely. Okay. Thanks for having me, Harold. Not at all. My pleasure. Welcome to uh, Conversations and Manhattan Network. It's a great pleasure. I've enjoyed reading the book very, very much. I wonder, maybe you could, we'll talk about it. There's a great deal that we can talk about in terms of the human condition. But would you share some of your own, your own background, you know, where you Absolutely. were born and drug up and so forth, and well, where you I'm went to school, and then we could talk more, good. you know, about the, uh, the, 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 the substance of the book. I'm a New Yorker, mm -hmm. um, and I have been a business journalist for the past two decades, really, and mm -hmm. uh, that's really where the roots of this book lie. I, back in the 19, I would say the mid-90s, um, I... I became aware of a really huge disconnect. I talk mm -hmm. about it a little bit in my book. Mm -hmm. When I would talk to, when I would be interviewing the um, people who were running the, the big corporations, mm -hmm. they would be telling me, you know, this was really the best of times. They really felt like their companies were um, positioned to really go out there, dominate the global economy. They felt like they had made some real changes and were really, really positioned to thrive. Mm -hmm. Yet when I would interview all kinds of other people, really people on all other rungs of the corporate ladder. I mm -hmm. was hearing very, very different kinds of stories, Harold. And people mm -hmm. were talking to me about just uh, what felt like insane working conditions. Really? They were putting in more and more time at their jobs. Uh, in many cases, they were working at companies that had um, had layoff after layoff. They were now doing jobs that once had been done by two or three or four people. Mm -hmm doing this within an environment in which their salaries were being cut or frozen, they were watching their benefit plans really shrinking, working harder and harder for less. And I thought, I have to try to make sense out of this. How can I hear such optimism at the top and really such unhappiness and confusion throughout the ranks? I wonder if that's a metaphor for the world at large. Well, it's certainly, I think it's really, it's clearly what's going on right now in the American workplace. It and clearly is, in yeah. your view. And you've researched this book extensively. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I started off thinking this was going to be two years of work. In yeah. fact, the problems, uh, I real, grew to realize this is not an East Coast, West Coast issue. This is not problems that are just going on in Wall Street or in the high-tech community. Uh, and and th as a result, I, it took me four years, and, and I think really, uh, I, I, I really came to feel that, that there are very, very deep problems, really, in corporate America, problems that I think have been going on, developing since, uh, we were talking about this, since the, since the mid to late 1970s, really. Uh -huh. I, I want to back up. You, you've been, you do, you, you're with Inca Magazine, yes, I think. Yes, I right am. On, I'm, maybe you could share a little of that. Absolutely. And you, You've been following the business world well, for, for a very time. long time. Yeah. I spent the 1980s at mm -hmm. Forbes magazine. Right. Since then, at Forbes. I, at Forbes, yes. I um, since then I'm the finance editor at Inc. Magazine. Mm -hmm. I'm the general editor at Bloomberg Personal Finance Magazine, mm -hmm. and have written about the world of work and business mm -hmm. from a lot of different directions. Yeah, Forbes is a major. Were you there when Mr. Malcolm absolutely. Forbes was there? Absolutely. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I had yeah. that great pleasure. Yeah. Okay. And and so you know a lot. And in fact. I think that that's one of the things that I was most surprised about as my research really continued. Many of the companies that I was hearing uh, enormous complaints about, enormous problems, learning about tremendous dissatisfaction among their workplaces, mm -hmm. were the very same companies that many of us think of as the, the best known and best respected companies, you know, the, the best traded stocks, uh, uh -huh. companies like Intel, Disney, IBM. Time Warner, where we are. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, yeah, I heard about quite a few, more. absolutely, you did. quite Time a few. Inkers, you've heard some bad things yes. like that? Well, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sorry at to say... At Forbes itself? Well, at Forbes? No, no, or at Bloomberg? No, or at Inc? No, well, no, I mean, <laughs> you know, I don't mean to be, you know... No, I, I, mm -hmm. I Or think did you happen to find an island in the uh, sea of misery? Well, in mm -hmm. fact, actually, it's interesting that you asked me that, mm -hmm. Harold, because, in fact, I, um, for many years, have now worked as an independent contractor, and I think that one reason for that is really because 
it's it's hard. I think that it's it's very hard to control the quality of your life and your work hours mm -hmm. when you're in any paid employment right now. And I think that that's because of real changes that have taken place in the American workplace mm -hmm. over these past um, mm -hmm. maybe 25 years. Mm -hmm. I think that what we see at many companies is really a sense that um, it's very hard for people to be able to carve out a boundary between their work life and their home life. And I think that this is something that I heard again and again from the people that I interviewed, that their, their jobs were really inescapable. They were, they were working not just when they were in the office, but when they were, um, you know, during their commutes to and from the office, during their lunch hours, during their evenings after they came home and had dinner with the families. Uh, people talk to me about uh, you know, uh, one woman, I, in fact, uh, it's really the way Gemma? that I lead Gemma, absolutely. Yeah, Gemma, it's the way yeah. I be mm -hmm. lead my book. Mm -hmm. This is a woman who, in fact, the happiest moment of her day is during the few minutes when she's on her commuter train home and the train passes through the tunnels leaving Grand Central Station and for a very brief period of time, her no cell phone, <laughs> well, her cell phone, phone won't work, so mm -hmm. she is forced to relax. And other than that, when her cell phone is working, she doesn't even walk down the street to walk to, you know, a lunch meeting mm -hmm. without being on the phone. And, mm -hmm. and I think that many people um, are working working this way because I think the workloads are really so enormous uh -huh. that they can't, you know, they can't um, perform their jobs mm -hmm. within just nine to five or nine to six or nine to eight. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in fact, you know, that, that's my, my, my book is really full of those kind of stories. They sure are. You know, one, one sure person I'm, I'm thinking about, this is someone who um, I, I'm thinking to myself, uh, he worked for one of the big financial services companies on Wall Street, and this is a man who described to me um, his effort on a Saturday morning to carve out a little bit of time alone with his with his toddler daughter, who he never saw during the week. What a waste week. of time! You well, could be doing a contract. Well, and in, and in fact, Harold, mm. he described to me he was wheeling her on um, through the parking lot on their way to a little breakfast alone, and the beeper went off. And as he said, yep. as he said, you know, he described real feelings of rage and resentment because, as he said, you know, when he's in the office, his employers don't want to hear about his his family, his daughter, his wife, you know, his other responsibilities, and yet on the weekend, he can't escape, you know. Or even on vacation, that you had examples oh, of. Absolutely, I mean, terrible, really. And, the going and in off. fact, statistically, mm -hmm. it's just remarkable. You know, I think three quarters of us, when we go away on vacation, you know, at some point we check in with the office, or we're traveling with laptops, or mm -hmm. we're checking in with our email. And mm -hmm. I think, in fact, uh, I, I talk about it in my book. There's a, a hotel down in Florida that actually has got a desk and chair set up on the shallow end of the swimming so pool. you can do I your guess books, huh? You can do, do your, your books, books absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, mm. the people tell me that, in fact, the table and chair are never empty. No, because be and so, you know, I yeah. think that really, yeah. that's, there's a real, there's a real loss, yeah, I think, for all of us because you, we have no downtime. We're working you, all the time. Right, you are. Okay, we're working all the time. A lot of themes that came up in yes, what you said. Yeah. And so with the idea, you, I said you're doing the books in the pool, but you're yeah. not really doing your books, you're doing their books. You're doing, absolutely. And you're not your life. And you made a, a distinction yeah. between, let's say, the uh, the life earning money or yes, working and right. the life which is, you know, your own life. Your quality, and they're, yes. And they're, they're blurring. And the they're blurring, between absolutely, in the you know, and in fact, Harold, people in the interests of profitability, corporate profitability. Of the people who own the, 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 the shareholders, the shareholders who right. own it, like at Enron and so forth. Absolutely, just, yeah. those people. And well, they're getting wealthy beyond. Uh, well, not yeah. the shareholders at Enron. That we not know at they're, Enron, they're as it happens, that's well. an example. But, but the point is that the people at the upper echelon of the society, the one percenters, half of one percent, they're just galloping. Well, and you know, and this you is say, in a certain sense, they're doing it in a certain way by exploiting their uh, well, white collar yes. uh, their white wage collar slaves. Employee, or is that a term that we shouldn't use? No, I, no we I, can you use. Think? Why you not? We can, use, use, we, that we can use that term yeah. because you know, I think that what's very interesting, if you go back to the to the fifties and sixties, you know, there was a real management theory mm -hmm. that you know you were running these big companies for it was like a triangle and the triangle was your customers your shareholders Service. and your employees oh, but the idea that's yeah. right in mm -hmm. other words that all of these 
that these were your stakeholders. Mm -hmm. That was the phrase, stakeholders. Uh -huh. and that, and, but now things have really changed. And if you, if you will talk to the people who are running these corporations, they're very explicit about the idea that companies should be run for one basic reason, which is the benefit of the shareholders. Right. And, and so in, when you have that kind of an environment, many things become fair game. You can um, cut or eliminate your employees' pensions because if you can save money, the uh, theory is, well, it's going to be more money that's going to go down to the sure. bottom line. Because they'll so, see there's a cost. The and financial guys that come in and say it's a cost, and they'll see a way to shave it, and they'll do well, it. Well, absolutely. Yeah. And so, for example, you have companies like, I mean, many, many companies, IBM, for example, a couple of years ago, who have made very massive, very uh, horrific changes in their pension, pension plans. Plan, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, same thing achieving, happened at Enron. Yes, them, yeah. uh, well, achieving mm -hmm. real um, cost savings. I mean, at IBM, when they made this change, the, the envisioned savings were $200 million a year. Now, um, it just so happened that along the way, what that also was going to do was basically devastate the pension savings of people in their older people. Mm -hmm. late 40s, 50s, the people who had been with the company for quite a while. And there was really, I mean, there, there are sometimes people are getting better at being able to try to resist some of these changes mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, it, with enough of an uproar, in fact, IBM pulled back a little bit. Yeah, but they had a chat yes, room on they, the Internet. It at, was, uh, well, what was it? It had a title. It was an interesting title. Well, Harold, Gripe fact, or something. Yeah, absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. we, that's one of the, th I spend a lot of time in those chat rooms in the mm -hmm. course of my research, you know, the places like www wow. Com. Back in the com. days, the, all I think we New Yorkers can appreciate this. There was www.9xsucks.com, mm -hmm. and the interesting thing about that was there was so much animosity among 9x's employees towards the company that the chat room continued to draw the comments of irate employees long after 9x had actually sold itself out to. Um, uh, so uh, it's yeah. interesting, really, and I think that the Internet is really surfacing increasingly as a place where people can begin to um, vent some of their anger yeah, they over may be these one kind of, of the and I think also developments uh, possibly, yeah, possibly if we're possibly. looking for some. Yeah. Well, and of course it's you know Harold, it's interesting because if the inter if if that kind of town hall mm -hmm. use of the internet is a positive thing, yeah. what's interesting to me is that technology has also surfaced, unfortunately, in many ways that have really made many people's work lives much worse. I mean, I think, and that's really but unexpected. But the technology is supposed to set us free. It's supposed to, absolutely. Isn't it? And, and in maybe fact, in the final analysis, it is well, going to do that if it, we get in if the we, right relationship If to we it? get, if we, if do, we can do, make do it from... Do you think that? I mean, because the technology is not going to be denied. Well, you know, you know? That, it can't you be know? denied, absolutely. Yeah. But I think that one of the things that, that people, many people talk to me about this idea that, you know, technology was supposed to make their work lives so much easier, so much more creative. Of, and free, well, and free that them was the from promise of it, the uh, free them, Wiener and people talked about. Yeah. Free them from the tedium of repetitive tasks, and yet, in fact, as one person who I interviewed in my book said, mm -hmm. and I think said it very well, he said, "You know, Jill, they used to use a ball and chain. Now <laughs> it's a laptop and a cell phone." Yeah. And I think that many people do feel. Well, they as do though, that in parole. They have a thing where they put it around well, your leg. Well, many people they feel that kind they, of a thing. They got they it around your leg. They feel as though their cell phones are like that yeah. because, in fact, really what the technology has actually and done is help you. facilitate a world in which your job you can never really escape your job yeah. you can be beeped you can be called you have this laptop you know you're at night when your family goes to bed you have one more chance that you can catch up you know check your emails one more time yeah. and I think one of the things that was so poignant to me, which I really heard again and again, is, you know, people would talk to me about their, their survival strategies, yeah. what they would try within to the do within the company so that they could try to keep up with these workloads that keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And one of the survival strategies was, yeah. oh, I'll just check in with messages one more time. Oh, I'll just see what's going on with my email or my voicemail. And all right, it's 11 o'clock at night, but <laughs> if I can just do it now, then it won't be waiting for me tomorrow. Yeah. But of course, it's really a, 
it's it's self delusional really mm -hmm. because of course you know tomorrow there will be for however many messages you took care of today there will be another batch tomorrow and mm -hmm. i think the latest statistics are that in the course of a day mm -hmm. all of us yeah. on average are bombarded with about 250 voicemail and email and the pages and the you know the pieces of the snail mail mm -hmm. i mean we're just it's it's very very hard well, this to would be keep a thing, up. Maybe, yeah, I wonder because this is coming in. and remember, it may, God, there's so many things that your 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 thing it brings up in mind. But I mean, I mean, it, it, it's a thing. I mean, how much? Let me just be a devil's advocate. Yeah, absolutely. How much of this is just uh, you know some some people that are just malcontents? You know, like Bob Cratchit. The absolutely. In Scrooge, other words, the people and Bob who, Cratchit yeah. would sort of say, "Could I have some more porridge absolutely, or something?" Yeah. And Scrooge would say, "Well, what are you?" And these, you've always got these malcontents, and they don't appreciate the great gift that these corporate structures are making for these people to get a chance to earn a really good form of a uh, good amount of li uh, living and so forth. And they're just ungrateful well, you know what, and they're actually, complaining, grumbling mouth. Harold, the question is an excellent one. And it's really something that I struggled with at every step of the way because, of course, the last thing I wanted was to really write a book that would be based on, you know, the ramblings of a few disgruntled people who really aren't any good and can't make it in the work world. Yeah, they're anymore. losers. They they're losers. Them losers. That's right. And the ads losers. on the television yes, tell them absolutely. self That's right. What's Go wrong? out and get yourself absolutely. adjusted What's wrong with you this is the way it is can't you get amazed, with the yeah. that's right can't mm. you keep keep with the program but in fact actually I am you know after four years of this research mm -hmm. I am really convinced that the problem is not really with those of us who feel as though there is really something wrong with the work world in which we're working 10 and 12 and 16 hours a day in which there are during what has been, you know, the greatest, most extended period of economic um, success, the bull market. I mean, mm -hmm. keep in mind the five years when I was working on this book were part of the most extraordinary period for the American economy ever. The Clinton and years. Yet, yeah. The Clinton years. Mm -hmm. And yet, remarkably, when you look at statistics, it is unbelievable. White collar employees, for many, in, in many categories, people's salaries were actually lower when adjusted for inflation at the end of the 1990s oh, than yeah. they were at the beginning of oh, it. Yeah. I mean, it, they're extraordinary it all went to the top, it? Yeah. You know, if you look mm -hmm. at a new college graduate mm -hmm. back in 1978, mm -hmm. compared to a new college graduate 25 years later and 30 years later, it is uh, 25 years later, it is unbelievable. Mm. Adjusted for inflation, they are earning dollars less, less an hour less, and this yeah, is yeah. you know if you would in believe, the biggest bull yeah, market ever Harold, yeah. if you would believe what mm -hmm. you read in the newspaper mm -hmm. these are the people who are they call them fortune magazine called them gold-plated, gold-collared workers. This yeah. is the idea that there was never a better time to be coming out of college. Supposedly, you know, you're being offered cappuccino on the one hand, gym memberships on the other hand, yeah. extraordinary salaries. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, actually, that wasn't the case. There were a couple of industries, mm -hmm. like Wall Street, um, a, a couple of technology subcategories in which it is true. Salaries were really pretty extraordinary for young kids coming out of school. Yeah. But in fact, for all of those people, one third of the people who were working in um, in contingent job as yeah. you know office temps. Manpower is the big yeah, employer manpower, now. Absolutely. Isn't that the largest employer it's now? It's the largest temps? employer. And you know temps, what? Yeah. Temps, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you know when you survey more than 50 percent, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has found that more than 50 percent of the people who are working in those kind of jobs are not doing it because they want to. They're doing it because they can't find full-time employment. No. And, and that's true for people, uh, you know, coming right out of school who can't make that leap to mm -hmm. a regular full-time traditional job. Mm -hmm. And that's especially true for people in their in their 40s and 50s because, oh, yeah. you know, of course, this is really, this is one of the great tragedies, I think, of my book is that during this period of the 80s and then most especially the 90s as these companies really went what i believe is cut back crazy you know yeah. looking for ways to cut their employee related costs in any and cut all costs, ways the financial cut costs, guys took absolutely over. cut costs 
And Manager. so what you would have is companies that would really pretty shamelessly, you know, lay people off when they get to be, you know, 40, 45, 50. Well, because you can at that because point, you have to pay them quite a bit of money. You, yeah. can get somebody, you can get some kid out of school, Absolutely. you can pay them less, yeah. you can just turn, we'll their, pay turn them, Bob you'll, Cratchit you'll, out to you'll pasture. You'll pay them less. Mm. They will, as one person said to me, you know, if you get somebody young enough, they won't see anything wrong about working 12, 14, 16 hours a day. After no, all, they're the coming from in, college in the with culture. the all-nighters. That's yeah. right. They mm. think that's the way it has to be. Mm -hmm. And also by by substituting a 20 year old for a 40 or 50 or 60 year old, mm -hmm. you're you're really reducing the cost for your health care plan. You mm -hmm. know because they probably that person is not even married. Uh, you know they're young. They won't sure, object. They, they have to work nights. Party you know, both ends of the uh, there were people that mm -hmm. you know are quoted in the book saying things like a nine to five job. What is that half time? Mm -hmm. I mean this yeah. is you know this is the the mindset that we really saw. Uh. And I think that really what is what is most upsetting for me now, looking at all of this from our, you know, post 9-11 vantage yes, point, right, is right. here, you know, my research and the, and, uh, the writing of this book, uh, I was asking these questions when times were so extraordinarily good. You know, why are we looking at these kind of cutbacks when times are so Imagine good? Imagine what's going to well, happen now, when times get and, bad and as now they look seem at to this, be heading That's for. right. And yeah. now look at what we're living with. Yeah, you know, yeah. we're, we're living through months in which, you know, uh, uh, 100,000 people a month are being laid off yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah. And, you know, this is what what is really so tragic about all of this was that during the 90s when companies were really making these extraordinary amounts of money and and where some of this could have been shared, you know, when times were good. It's so ironic. Yeah. Well, you know, it's so ironic, Harold. Mm. You know, when times were bad, we saw companies make these leaps from traditional health care plans to the HMOs to the slightly worse HMOs and on and on. Yeah, yeah. When times were good, did anybody ever see a health care plan get better? No. I mean, you know, so we make it through the 1990s, this period of extraordinary boom. And ironically enough, if you look in the, the beginning of the decade, it was almost universal that if you worked for a big company, you had health care insurance. Oh, absolutely. By the end, yeah. one out of every four people who worked for those companies no longer had health care yeah, coverage. Right. And that's when times were so fabulous. Yeah, and and, you, you know, if you look at uh, one of the, uh, st the really, I think, shocking statistics that I look at, 1998, yeah. you know, by anybody's measure. 98 was just a, f a f phenomenal Bad year. Yeah, it was yeah, a great yeah. year. Yeah. Uh, there were, <laughs> there were a few things wrong. Stock market top, was yeah. up. You know, corporate profits were extraordinary. Mm. All right. That year was the year of all of the 1990s for the highest level of layoffs mm -hmm. of the decade. Is so, that right? So now mm. you might say to me, playing devil's advocate, mm. well, Jill, you know, really, companies, that's why things were so yeah, good. Right. Companies okay. really had yeah. to run a very tight ship. Yeah. We had to be lean and mean. Mm -hmm. But that was also a that year language, in which, yeah. mm. that was a year in which more than $1 trillion was spent on mergers and acquisitions, even though the clear body of evidence is that the vast majority of mergers and acquisitions do not work out, do not create shareholder value, in fact, often uh, often Don't erode yeah. the value of the mm -hmm. companies that have merged together. But that's been the so hot thing. So here we have that's, yeah, that's been the hot, the hot thing. And, and so you have one trillion dollars, mm -hmm. one trillion on those, which are probably not going to work out, mm -hmm. at the same time well, that you are laying off. Mm, extraordinary numbers of people, and, and so you know it doesn't. That's well, where the disconnect is. you had, you had you are. Let me just say for a minute. I understand <laughs> it's quite a litany and it's quite a trend that we see and everything like that. But you had uh, Mr. Greenspan was so pleased, and he everybody was, so was pleased, pleased right, because everyone. we had an unemployment rate of only three point nine. That's right. We had it with no inflation. And in fact, everybody was wondering how this could ha possibly go. Know, could we bring the interest rates down below six percent? How could it go? Uh, you know, and everybody was saying we and just you know reached what, some Harold? sort of nirvana, and everybody was happy. That's right. Uh, and you know what? Yeah. That's right. And, and you're trying to say in the midst of all that happiness, well, there was a lot of unhappiness yes, and in at, fact, the, at the actually, core. You've really you say that. I do you say that. So? And, yeah. and, and in a fact, sociological diminution of the quality well, of I life actually, in America. And in fact, actually, you can, by looking, by kind of taking in apart some of those statistics, because in fact, you're right, the unemployment rate was really extraordinarily low. Yeah, and and so some that. people would say, well, Jill, what does it matter that all these people were losing their jobs because they of course you, lose, you just yeah. get another. However, yeah. I will say that I in enormous detail yeah. crunched these numbers. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Harold, the reality is that if you lost your job mm -hmm. during this period where the um, where the Bureau of Labor Statistics tracked um, tracked the trends of people who were laid off 
who had been at their jobs for more, their previous jobs for more than three years. So mm -hmm. in other words, these are the displaced people who had been what's called long tenured. So mm -hmm. they're looking at what happened to those people. Did they find other jobs? Yeah, they all mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. But in fact, more than, more than one quarter of those people averaged new jobs where their salaries we were lower by more than 25 percent. Is that a fact? So really? That yeah. is a fact, so and I looked at it, a, and it's not only true over the long run, it's true in every single a race yeah. to the bottom. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And so what you have is people do get rehired, but now, you know, they're no longer, they're a little bit older, so, you know, they're, they're not too desirable. I mean, mm. I literally talked yeah. to people who had been managers who ended mm. up who literally, I mean, one man, uh, there, were, there were extraordinary stories in my book. Mm, yes, there one are. man who literally, until he managed to resurface at a salary of below 50% mm -hmm. of what he had earned, he was delivering newspapers. There are people who they do find work, but they're cleaning houses. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, it's an extraordinary thing. And yeah. you know, what is remarkable about these people is, you know, these are not you might think the, the radicals, the disgruntled, the this and that. In fact, these are the people who totally believe in the system. Yeah. They believe the silent often, majority. Yeah, they yeah. believe in, you know, mm. actually, the mm. people, I interviewed people who literally tears would be in their eyes as they would describe what they f saw as the, their betrayal by companies like AT&T, American Express. We should these list places. them, yeah. Oh, a, it, I mean, they're in every industry, AT&T, IBM. The Russell, oh, oh, it's, the Russell it is. 2000. It's it, what I'm saying is it's not just a particular company, it's oh, systematic. No, no. It's, it's, it's systemic it's absolutely. So they would be arguing a comparative advantage. They'll take economic theory and say they will make the investments where it's best. And also, yes. if you get too uppity, yeah, if you do, on, yeah. first of all, we can undercut the unions. We used to have unions that were able well, to serve a function. Yes. They still do for some and so forth. But with all the contingency and with all the people being freelanced out and that sort of thing, they don't hold so well, so the union power is being well, undercut. And Harold Letner, That's an issue. Then on the second issue, it's all being done within a world that is rapidly globalizing. Yeah. If you get too uppity, yeah, yeah, we'll just oh, go absolutely. to a country where chattel labor, chattel slavery well, absolutely. applies. And we'll move over to uh, some other country. Yeah, so and, that uh, in fact you have, uh, so that's have an, that, and that's following the laws of management of finding comparative advantage. That's Manufacture and get done whatever it is that can get done. Well, at you, the know most effective race you know what, Harold? With really a focus on financial stock yes. market value as, as, sole as, criteria. as a sole criteria. And is of that course, a situation that exists in terms of the way the world's operating now? Well, with I, you with see, what is heartbreaking, Harold, I mean, and this is really, I think, one of the great tragedies of the legacies of the 1990s is that. Th the Ameri this model that I've described where, you know, these companies are being run not for our triangle of the customer and the employees as well as the shareholders, but just for one reason alone, the, the bottom line and what's going to come to the shareholders, and that's all that matters. And the shareholders is only a very small percentage Absolutely. of the American. And I think the, it's but probably 5% on an individual basis own all the capital assets. It's, it's Almost everybody's dependent upon the la the income they get from their Absolutely. labor contribution Absolutely. to production well, of and course. then one third other thing that I had besides globalization and moving to sweatshops in China or Charles Kernigan shows very mm -hmm. well about Absolutely. how they exploit He's labor overseas magnificent and, so job. and do that here another uh, another thing is that the technology itself is, is coming replacing. and That's is replacing right. labor mm -hmm. Absolutely. and all of our system of thinking on a macro scale or life scale is based on a labor theory of value we've got our sociological values wrapped up in this idea that you're going to get identity by having a, a labor relationship to production a job or something and the well, assets are all owned by a few, and we have an economic plutocracy in terms of the ownership of that which is increasingly responsible for production, capital assets. Well, we don't course, have a movement to democratize that. No, we don't, that. and, and in fact... It's a plutocracy. And, well, and it is it, a plutocracy. Yeah, well, I, is that I can't, fair to I can't, say I, you work I, within yeah, the I can't, I, I can't argue with you this. You do not argument. argue with that. I don't know. The and American th and the world economy is a plutocracy. Well, and in fact, the world economy is really follow where America leads because mm -hmm. this, no, you know, I mean, here we are, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's very sad. This, mm -hmm. is, this is the model that works, supposedly, mm -hmm. and yet I would argue, mm -hmm. how can we say that this is the model that works because, in fact, you know, we, we, you watch, say, a company like 
Disney. Mm. I mean, let's just talk about Disney for a minute, all right? Dis Eisner. Mm. Yeah, I mean, mm. it's a um, Disney in many ways. You know, they embody many of the trends that I look at in my book. You yeah. know, really ruthless obsession about cost cutting at mm. the same time that Mr. Eisner himself has taken home uh, obscene. It's obscene, <coughs> the growth of the <coughs> salaries of our top executives. Obscene. <coughs> as the salaries I'm, of the people go down. I'm choking as you I'm talking. Can, yeah. <laughs> I apologize. Yes, mm. it is obscene. Mm. And while this is going on, when the stock was going well, people would say, well, how can you argue, really? Disney is a perfect example. It's a magnificent company. It's doing so well. In fact, Disney has gone through many problems in mm -hmm. recent years. Mm -hmm. It has laid off more people. No one has ever asked Mr. Eisner to give back some of that money that no, he has taken along the way. No, you had an idea in there about how the, some of those stock options they, that they've had, they ought to give them a three-year <coughs> period for the... To make Before sure they that they yeah, that was a very interesting idea. Thank they got you. all these stock options, and they own the own they own the technology. And there's another thing, Lord Keynes. I yeah. introduced to you this thing about Lord Keynes saying in 1930, Maynard K John Maynard Keynes, who's the the you know the uh, the leading light in terms of economic theory. And these <laughs> things all are at a certain ultimate level, particularly as you bring in the political and the larger systems understanding and so forth. These are all informed by economic theory in a certain sense. How do we develop? Uh, you know, economically, but Lord, even Lord Keynes, who had the uh, Bretton Woods institutions, were you know under his International Monetary Fund, World Bank, and so forth, and uh, also you know he had all these, and he wrote this thing to his grandchildren, saying or high, uh, saying, on the on the demand <coughs> side, as it were, trying to get some income capability into the hands of people to buy that which can be produced. He said that uh, in 1930 he wrote a letter to his grandchildren. That's about now, and he said that we are going to be confronted with technological unemployment, that the technology is going to be displacement, is going to have the ability to displace human labor activity, both intellectual and physical, in the productive process, mm -hmm. and that we're going to be confronted with that. And there are many people, Ray Kurzweil and others, who are not, or, or you could take their data and say, we're not so sure that all these projections of the model that Henry Ford's factory would provide more work for the agricultural workers off the farm, that that is catching up with us, yeah. and the technology will be displacing of the human well, input to the productive process, and that we're caught in a real situation where the creation of employment or employment, uh, you know, the Full Employment Act, the Employment Act of 1946 is our basic grounding policy statement. We're going to distribute income by employment. We're going to have these wage slaves, and we don't have any kind of a way well, to have no them way. related to the way things are being produced. We have a revolution on our hands unless we come up with some Something sort of thinking that can yes. begin to make qualitative change in uh, the now, way the system is operating now. Do you agree with that? Well, let's, let's look. Not. Let's look at an industry in which this is really playing itself out, the banking industry, mm -hmm. in which more than 100,000 people were displaced by ATM machines alone, okay. right? Okay. Now, in fact, yeah, no. unfortunately, so, so you have a situation in which to begin with, employees are, they're, they're effectively, they're on the run, right? Mm -hmm. We're being, they're being picked off, you know, the machines are coming, they're being replaced, so people are vulnerable. Maybe to not even as much not as they could be if we were really to allow the system to go and there will be people in the name of comparative advantage following that course. Yeah, who knows, that's right. Yeah. We don't know how far things could no, go, we, but we, it's clearly... We're, we're, we're skewed <clears throat> in our prejudice, sociologically and so forth, to the idea of a good day's job, a good day's pay for a good day's work, labor, is the way by working hard? Yes, by working hard. That's right. You don't have to stay okay, home with so your then, mother. No, no, uh, you don't have to right. stay home with your kid. You welfare mother, get out there and pick and up. And pick papers. up a job. Okay, so now here you, you are. Yes, absolutely. And you don't but waste your time with your kid like that yes, person. Yes, but you all were right. Now, about. all right. But here we are. The this industry, the mm. banking industry, okay. which traditionally has been a pretty good industry. It's treated its white collar workers well. Now, technology yeah. has kind of caused this great displacement. Um, in the past, employees were treated so well that the white collar community did not unionize because it felt like it's yeah, you know companies like Chase uh, were known we in, were by the employees as mo mother poly. Chase, mother yeah. Chase. Yeah. Okay, mm. so now you have things going on. Like I talked about them in my book. Take a company like Bank of America. Mm. Where Extraordinary things have gone on in the quest for profitability yeah. above all, bottom line, co you know, mm -hmm. profits above all. You have a company which had benefits for employees who worked at a certain level. They didn't have to be, it was kind of prorated benefits, but for employees who worked, I think it was 30 hours in order to cut costs. Bank of America cut 
their work hours by one hour. Mm. By cutting their work hours by one hour, they were able to eliminate all benefits for these people, uh. thus achieving these. Okay, so now here. That's clever. Yes, clever. Oh, very clever. So, all right. So, you know, now you have Bank of America offering its employees a chance to do meaningful volunteer work. <laughs> now, what is this? I talk about it in my book. It's literally <laughs> called adopt an ATM machine. Oh, and no. this is what it means. Okay. Adopt clean up, an paper, clean, up at, clean up, keep it shiny, uh, polish it, make sure there's no garbage around it. You kidding. do this, you volunteer, uh, you do it on your own time. Uh -huh. Not in, it has Don't nothing to do kid. with yeah. it has mm. nothing to mm. do with your salary. Nothing. Okay. Mm. Now I talked to well, many. Why would anybody do that? What? What? Well, Two thousand people signed up for no, it, fools. and this is the thing I mm. think, which is scary. Really, yes, they're trying scared, to get in brownie points. They do anything, as they do. anything and, you to know, try and keep my little place to get, to do less because right if they I'm, don't, I'm, they're the wolves at the, the door. the next time the machine they comes say. around, maybe you're the next one to go. And it is what is really a form of slavery? Well, it's a, it is it's slavery. a very coercive mm. situation. That's clear. And you know, people. These are the same people. I'm sure those two thousand people who signed up. The people, the kind of people who are talking to me about how they have no time anymore to be involved with the PTA, to volunteer mm -hmm. with the, you know their church, their their synagogue, to mm -hmm. be part of community organizations. Mm -hmm. They don't have time. They barely have time to do their jobs and come home, have dinner before they're scrambling. I mean, I talk to people Scrambling, who, picking up yeah, notices well, from the office. Well, yeah. I mean, the, yes, in other words, I tell Harold, I talk to people who literally would bring their yeah. laptops yeah. to their children's little league games Great. because yeah. they, you know, mm -hmm. you watch when your child is not up, mm -hmm. you can be, mm -hmm. I mean, this is the world in which we're living and yeah. I think it is really so remarkable that these same trends, you know, it used to be, well, let me say this. I looked at, at really all periods mm. of, of economic prosperity mm. in the whole post-World War II environment. Okay. And, and it is undeniable that this, that this period of the, of the 80s, 90s, our bull market, our period of unparalleled prosperity are the, is the only time of prosperity in this whole period in which white collar conditions got worse not better white collar we're <coughs> talking white collar management white collar <coughs> lawyer we're talking about uh, white collar educated people <coughs> Excuse sort of me, thing. everything that makes a big um, difference. secretaries yeah. back yeah. office i mean it's it runs the gamut yeah. teachers i mean it's really it's all kinds of professions teachers, yeah, really back off Wall the teachers didn't used to want to be unionized because it wasn't cool to be Absolutely. union if well, you are fact, a professional you're yeah. above the you're well, genteel I mean, or Howard, above the fray and i think that that's now we've got all kinds of people that are becoming there's a book out now what is it called um what's it what's it called when there's a baseball player who is a free, free agent, agent free agent yes, nation is the thing right. the idea is saying everybody's becoming <coughs> free you can shift as you want and you can get the best deal because you've got the talent that is really going to be up for bidding because you're really good so they can appeal yeah. to that and that's something it's like in shum peter's kind of view of things of you know creative entrepreneurialism get out there and hustle and you can make it your way and read another yeah. self-help book and you can do it, and, and you we can keep do it open it. for that's that. Right. Kind well, of you know, it's really that's part of the context of the thinking that's going on now. Yeah, that's the people who want to tell us that this is the best of all worlds. The best of all worlds, and that. this is the world writ large, because it's not only here. Although your book concentrates, yeah, concentrates on the world, on here, uh, right. it is the world system that is in place now with the yes. trends that have to do with the workers in the United States. But it also applies in terms of the of the situation on a world scale that the wealthy and the well-to-do and the yeah. well-connected and the clever That's right. are getting we'll more absolutely. and more on absolutely. a world scale and that the inequities yes. and the trends in terms of that not only in the United States but in the world there's a plutocratic few yeah. and they are the ones who control the media they control the corporations they control the the agenda that sort of thing they've got lapdog intellectuals that go along will find a cool. niche so in their system it's right. like feudalism in a certain kind of sense but and everything like that and that's the system that we're being asked to, to buy into that's buy right into that, accept as being appropriate to the way in as which being, this world should be right. organized and with no leadership in terms of intellectual or other suggestions of how things could be and done differently. Harold, and you, do you think the Harold, world wait. leadership might be in trouble by a um, various forms of outbursts of angst, existential angst by well, the people who Well, and Harold, let me follow up on this because in fact, revolutionary times I think that we are, of the I believe that we are in serious intellectual trouble and one way that you can tell how serious this is is look at who is presenting themselves to us as the intellectuals of the Corporate of the business world. Guys. Well, 
the <laughs> Andy Groves of the world. Yeah, you know, yeah, the yeah. founder of Intel. Dare I mean, if you paranoid. ever you read these... Only the paranoid survive. Only yeah. the paranoid survive. They project their own Al views Dunlap, the world. Yeah. you know, who now has been Chainsaw discredited. Al. Chainsaw Al. Chainsaw Al. Mm. You know, I've, I've read the intellectual ramblings of these people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Al Dunlap, in his in his book appropriately entitled Mean Business. Yeah, yeah. You know, he has a chapter in which he, he taught he calls the chapter why a one hundred million dollar CEO is the best bargain a company yeah, can yeah, get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, he talks about mm -hmm. what he achieved when he came into Scott Paper and I believe fired half the staff mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, eliminated before he came. Scott used to as part of its kind of corporate program. It used to make about three million dollars worth of donations to the community. He eliminated that. Yeah, Everything yeah, yeah, had yeah. to go down to the to the bottom line, the shareholders, and of course he took home his hundred million dollars. Keep in mind the shareholders are a minuscule it, class in our they're society. Mi absolutely. Now, minuscule. Minuscule. And but they're getting more all the time. And they have some sort of an advantage, particularly as the technology and something other than labor is responsible for production. Production, there's a mismatch there's at a, a large mismatch. systematic absolutely. level between the theoretical or intellectual understanding of how we organize things and the way things are done, and yeah. it's coming home to haunt the system and those who would ask us to accept it well, in a large way. The now, and, and let's, or are talk, they? now let's talk about the but mismatch what about for a second. Thing? Oh, everybody all right, back to that, that's right. Everybody getting off in the idea that you can look you at can it individually, it. you can do it yourself, and people are buying it, the young people are. Yes, well, are the young people getting restive? Are they starting to get well, restive? you know, they have, I, my feeling is they have the think? worst of all worlds. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at, uh, f Ask how many people feel that they are even among 40-year-olds who mm -hmm. feel that they're as well off as their parents were who mm -hmm. were able to retire with and pensions and this and that. Yeah. And now look at the 20 year They're even worse off than we are now. And mm -hmm. so, so when I hear about the free agent nation and this, yeah. you know, this um, romanticization clever, of, you know, how wonderful life is when you're self-employed. Now, 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 but yeah. let's say, mm -hmm. there clearly are some people who, who are they like to be self-employed. This is what they want to do. They want to say, I mean, I am self-employed, yeah. and actually, yeah, I would, them. yes, you're I, I don't them. want, but, yeah, but so fact, maybe you're the host. However, you be, but, but, come but like Harold, you know, no. this is what, I no, okay. can say this, yeah. you know, we live in a country in which actually the tax structure is very much kind of, there are many strikes against you. It is not easy to be self-employed mm -hmm. and to be even as well off as you were when you were a corporate employee. 40 you have million to buy of them don't have any health care. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. You have mm -hmm. to buy your own health insurance. You don't have a pension except for what mm -hmm. you can save. Mm -hmm. You are being ta you have to pay your <coughs> own self-employment tax. I mean, mm -hmm. so that here you are. Yeah, That's maybe it. you're self-employed, and for that you get the right to hustle every day. Yeah. You get the work, you know. Hustle but hard. Uh, yeah, yeah, hustle yeah. hard. And it's if like you jungle. are among that few, you're always talking about that few. But if mm -hmm. you are among the lucky few mm -hmm. who are really good and maybe well connected and all that of that, too. that's Some right. Aren't you may very that way. well come mm -hmm. out way ahead of the game. You mm -hmm. may have control over your work life. I mean, I have mm -hmm. always been able to pick up my kids from school. I mm -hmm. mean, all of that has yeah, been yeah. a great thing. Yeah. But you have to earn so much more to compensate for all of these. And also, will that apply? Uh, also, will that apply <coughs> to the mass? If you start, you're talking about a society. We're not talking about a few gifted, few celebrities, almost, and that sort of thing. That's and right. You're talking to the mass. It's an irresponsible thing to take those values and have those apply to the whole system Absolutely. because it's heading for trouble. There'll be blowback. There will the be CIA blowback. Talks Absolutely about blowback. blowback. And we're That's beginning right. to get it. It I could be on a world already. scale. That thing that happened downtown was part of that. Yes. It could be. Yeah. People are seeing that. They got some countries in South America. Yeah. Uh, 14 families own the whole thing and everybody else is a wage slave and that well, sort I mean, of thing. Well, I mean, I think that I actually, mean, you know, blowback, blowback takes many different forms. I mean, certainly people talk to me about, you know, corporate sabotage. I mean, people talk oh, to yeah. me about there are, you know... Terror, there, it'll be called terror. Yeah, it'll be called are, terrorism. There are, you know... Um, groups that will try to, you know, boycott certain companies because of the ways that they treat their employees. I mean, I think actually, in fact, my vision of hope yeah. is the opposite yeah, of free agent nation of because of in because fact actually grim, yeah. I think that really one thing that white collar employees realized many of them during the 1990s is that you can't make this alone you can't fight this alone you know you cannot single handedly the company the system is much bigger than you oh, it's huge, and yeah. you can be replaced and, and you it's can got the be big mo going yeah. for it Mr. And I, Bush it's used got, to say it's, big it's absolutely it's got Motor. the big mo going mm. for it and mm. i think that you know this is 
Historically, in the post-World War II environment, white-collar employees thought they didn't need unions because they thought, you know, we're better we're educated, we're, that's right. That's for the whole employee. That's, that's right, that's the, right. Uh, but in fact, if you look at the 1990s, especially at certain industries like telecommunications, where within one company you would have both a unionized subset of the workforce and a non-union yeah. white-collar yeah. subset. Yeah. In fact, the unions were able to shelter their employees from the worst of many of these cutbacks when there would be layoffs, at least the most senior would be protected. Whereas, you know, white collar, the more senior you were, the, the more, more vulnerable, vulnerable you were because, because, because your you salary was higher, you were married, you were older, you. that's right. Yeah, it's, become, it's becoming jungle-like. I mean, Absolutely. really jungle-like oh, with is. no kind of thing and, like that. Yeah. Jungle-like, yeah. and we talk about our quote-unquote and intellectuals, some mm. of these you know, people who think that actually the because they're running a, no, the people no. who think because I'm running a company, yeah. uh, uh, I I'm can now say I'm an intellectual, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So you have somebody like Andy Grove, only, only the paranoid survive, who will really describe this Darwinian world and believe that this is, this is good. Way it should be. Because and to this is them, to grow. the proof of how mm -hmm. just it all is mm -hmm. is how they're at the top. Well, of course, if they're at the top, this must be a world in which everything is all for the best. Well, there's really. a theoretical explanation for saying, uh, Chum Peter would say that you have to creative entrepreneurialism or creative capitalism, but you have to die, let the old system die, I mean, in order for the new to come. And that's in the saddle now. I mean, that sort of thing, or Van Hayek may be on a real thing like that. But you don't have any kind of a system. A couple things. One is you're talking about the corporations, but we have a lot of other society. We have a lot of nonprofit yeah, entities. Absolutely. We have a lot of things like universities. We have a lot of things like organizations that are not within the corporate realm. The corporate yes. realm, some people say, is almost inherently the most well, authoritarian you know, or yep. quasi-fascist system that's you know ever been achieved and so how forth. But does it apply to the whole society? Like we have any place where you get three people together, they set up a bureaucracy. Yeah, and so you get yes. all this kind of thing going well, on and the uh, petty things that go on in that in that realm as well. What it I affects the whole society, it including it education it institutions and everything. It affects the society in many the different ways. So you know, based on fear. You know, I would talk to in the course of you know my 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 research, and then afterwards when I would appear on call-in radio shows and get a lot of feedback from the community that way. You know, I'd hear everything from teachers talking about how you know, well, um, now they're they're. Uh, kids are being dropped off at the schools at 7.30 or 8 in the morning because mm -hmm. the parents have to, or they, you know, the teachers have to stay later because, you know, they, um, they, no, no one is there to pick up the kids at the mm -hmm. end of the day. Or, you know, people talking to me about how, uh, parents talking also, I can't help my children with their homework. I'm too busy. I have Maybe. my work at all. And, you know, so that, so that's, that's the teachers of younger children. Look at col what's going on in colleges and universities where fewer and fewer people are being tenured mm -hmm. and where we're seeing more and more of the work being filled, performed by low income. Adjuncts, yeah, right? adjuncts, like absolutely. adjuncts, exploit the absolutely. Devil out of them. Yeah. And the thing is, I mm -hmm. think that this, you know, certainly the nonprofit world, the harshest of what we see, these people are still sheltered. After all, nonprofits don't have to make money. They don't have to have a return no, to their shareholders. The but I think that we're in, an we're in a world in which overwork, we're losing all sense of what are appropriate limits of work and what these boundaries are between your work and home. And mm -hmm. I think that, that that's a cancerous kind of a trend that is really seeping into all parts of the culture. Really. Yeah, yeah, and there should be more places for something other to do the, the work. Also, I can't help but I just want to go into it in depth or anything like that, but I see that the work and the production of those kind of things are like Buckminster Fuller or, or, or James Joyce said, history is a nightmare yeah. from which I'm attempting to awaken, that it's a sort of nightmare that we're coming out of 200,000 years of human experience, we're coming to a thing where the tremendous concentration on making money and yeah. materialism and job and that sort of thing I is going to be, in some way, if we do not uh, destroy our species or something like that, it's going to be reversed from what it is now. And the concentration is going to be on how do you live a life well rather than how do you function within this economic. There's so much concentration on it because the system is not right the system is not right so and yet and and yet we need and an yet we need all we we desperately now need what are some you, you know, some of the things uh, troubles yeah. you don't have much time you know yes. but we yeah. but uh, some of the alternatives i know you had a few th good things to say about the system to begin to try and um uh, esops or they, they try yeah. and get or they try or even that can be misused but they try and get some um ownership or some movement away from the plutocratic Absolute, concentrated you know, 
ownership of capital assets. If, if the whole society were vested with a viable holding of ownership of the collective whole system that is there, and the, the, the system, we have a capability of providing for everyone on this planet now abstract, technological, knowledge-based capability of making this planet one that would serve the, the needs, uh, the life support needs on an increasing scale of all six billion heading for 10 well, you billion. Know what, how, but we don't yeah. have a system that lets us a, deliver yes. that. We get, it's only delivering for the 20%. Well, you so know, we one have a of system the things like that. What are some of the, <coughs> uh, the hallmarks or some of the guide one points of, the things of a that system I, yes. that could begin to build a system where people, instead of being concentrated always on this idea of making a living and so forth, they would be able to have uh, income from some source yes. that would make it possible for them to live a life of uh, what it is they want what to do rather they than what they're absolutely. made to do well, by Well, you know, one uh, of the things that I, because of course, one of the things also that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm practical person, right? Uh -huh. I mean, there are some things that I think I might hope for. I might hope that the government would intervene, but I don't delude myself into thinking that that's going to happen in this regime. The end of big regime. government has come yeah, to an end, I, Mr. Clinton. I don't know what we believe, really. Welfare. They're wasting their you know, time with babies. Yes, that's right. And yeah. I mean, I think it's obviously, it's clearly not a Democrat or Republican issue no, because, in fact, things, many worldwide. of the trends that I yeah. looked at took place under the Clinton regime, oh, yeah. so I'm not going yeah. to blame Bush alone or something like that for that. But I think that you know, one thing that I actually there's believe... There's a lack of intellectual imagination. Yes, and, but one, and there is a lack of leadership. And, and, yes. this, and one of the things that I really feel could make a very big impact, there's a tremendous amount of money right now that is controlled within pension funds, oh, yeah. union pension funds, corporate pension funds, mm -hmm. within mutual funds. Now, it is true that, that the individual does not own much stock. I mean, and what people own is generally does tend to be in their retirement savings accounts mm -hmm. if they possess anything at all. But actually, these, what are called, they're called institutional investors, the yeah, mutual yeah. funds, the pension funds, yeah. the union funds, they, they control trillions of Absolutely. dollars. And I believe that if those institutional investors began voting with their pocketbooks, mm -hmm. in other words, investing in companies that practice, that follow fair workplace practices, um, avoid it. In other words, punishing companies when they rely on the easy strategies of a layoff or cutting benefits rather than figuring out positive yeah, ways to... The, you're, you're being but you really think that's possible? Well, and because fact, I mean, if I mean, uh, you the see, comparative advantage. I mean, if they do that, well, they they will be taken to they now, will be and, eaten and for lunch now, by however, the hard driving people you know who are going to follow the Darwinian rules of what yes, you have to do. Now, and that, but that's what's and interesting, that's what's Harold. In, that's what's interesting what, what because, these, in other words, where are these values going to come from? Harold, that are going to be included in this is the process. one thing that I think is a worth is is a worthwhile issue that people need to look at. Yeah. What is the short term? payoff, yeah. right? I mean, mm. we're, that's part of our problem with our lack of intellectual leadership. First There's a focus next on quarter what is earnings, next yeah. quarter or tomorrow. What's mm -hmm. the stock doing tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And I'm yeah. going to get in and out as fast as I can. Yeah. Over the long run, there is clear research that documents that companies that have lower employee turnover, that do tend to practice these, you know, these fair workplace, you know, that don't pollute all of these things, they do tend to be more profitable and productive over time. So who are, now, some, of those, so who are some of those companies that we can laud and say are doing great now? Is well, it our big giants? I mean, do you want to tick off some of the no, Russell I, 2000? No, do or I not? Or who are they? Are they, well, they little mom and pop things Well, you know, the I'll choose, that, there's one company you know, that I'm, I think, I'm yes, that's right, you're, devil's again, advocate, devil's yeah. advocate, yeah. but there's a company out there that you probably haven't heard of. I think it's interesting that it is not a publicly traded company, uh -huh. which gives it a little bit more room to maneuver. It's called SAS Institute, S-A-S yeah. Institute. It's a software company. At this company, not only do they not expect people to work 12, 14, 16 hours a day, they literally turn off the, the switchboard at 5 o'clock. They lock the gates at 6 o'clock. Everybody goes Lock's home. Out. Yes, <laughs> and you can't work. Not yeah. only do they not kind of mm -hmm. cut and eliminate, you know, health care benefits. They have on-site health care facilities which are provided free to all employees and their families. And their they can families. do that for less than an HMO yes, they, contract? Yeah, they figure yeah. that's right. They it's save cheaper? money. Yeah, they well, save money. Their employees are healthier. With less. They Maybe have child care yeah. on site. I mean, and, mm -hmm. and this is a company that actually, so you would say, well, Jill, what is this, utopian? Yeah. They yeah. can't possibly well, be making money. But in fact, this company mm -hmm. has been studied because, in fact, in an industry, 
in which the software industry, in which you might look at returns of four or five or six percent a year, this is a company whose, whose profitability has increased on average by 12 to 14 percent. This is a company that consistently outperforms its peers. And I think that, you know, there are not a lot of models. There's many more models for the, you know, Jack the Welsh's, you know, place. Neutron yeah. Jack, mm -hmm. let's, you know, let's cut Chains till it hurts. Now. I yeah. mean, Jack yeah. Welsh, you know, it's, it's horror, really, Jack. Management yes. technique, yeah. yeah, it's called management technique. Mm -hmm. He will say that every year you fire the bottom 10%. And, mm -hmm. you know, I would say, well, mm -hmm. hold on, Jack. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're bottom firing the bottom 10% and the bottom 10%, yeah. you know, maybe eventually that's even going to catch you up to you. You also had the idea, if I may, you also had the idea, it was very interesting to me, where you said the people that are getting well, wealthy or wealthy do uh, uh, the stock options and that. Yes, and you said, why, right. don't we, why don't we Todd. keep a, keep an escrow Absolutely. kind of thing, three years or something, to make sure that's got a longer legs period before Absolutely. that's paid out. But also, what about the idea of being able to get, um, I saw one time Mitch McConnell say they ought to have stock options. For, I mean, what about the idea that if it's good for the wealthy who have the ownership of the instruments of technology that are creating the wealth, instead of putting all the concentration on creating these jobs for people, about expanding ownership as a general principle, as Absolutely. a way of distributing income you away from the labor theory I value that's that informs that's a wonderful, that's wonderful. And yeah. in fact, I think that, you know, you have these companies, you know, it's, I agree with you completely, ownership. yes. No. However, the irony is you will have companies that on the one hand will not hesitate to give their CEOs so many options or outright stock grants no, give that it to they the can folks. yes and they will and say then you they could, will argue you could increase the capital formation Absolutely. available yes but you they will argue wrongly i think mm -hmm. yet that doesn't stop them from arguing it that to give it to the ceo is somehow motivational yeah. to give it to the, the employee fun. base is diluting value i think we're going to have to give it to everybody in a way and that's going to be able to create a society where people are going to become increasingly free that's a large thing it might take 20 30 years to come but this is a breakpoint period and if there's a breakpoint book it seems to me that's laid out some of the negative things as well as some of the glimmering shadow, uh, silver linings that are behind it it's yourself thank you Ran so out of much time. Harold. I could talk thank to you, you for 15 20 hours easily absolutely you know but uh, the book let me let's show that then again right up now at the outset here here we've got come in tight focus on this book it's in the shelves it's in the book absolutely store now. Yes. and is there is there a, a website address we could go to this um, or? well my website address is Inc Fraser I N C mm -hmm. F R A S E R at mm -hmm. AOL.com all right that's good and then that could be and it's oh we should say it's published by W.W. Um, w. Norton and w. Company. W. w Norton you could contact them and get it and it's in the book it's really good it's in the it's in the tradition of Jeremy Rifkin thank you and yes, the work absolutely I am a Barbara great Garson I'm uh, a great electronic sweatshop this, absolutely who are a couple of the others? We've got a minute or so left. Well, I mean, if you look at Barbara we're... Ehrenreich's book, she's looking yeah, at these same Dine. kind of issues yeah. as they relate to, to the, the blue-collar blue workforce. Workers, yeah. But I think that there are, you know, quite a few of us who really feel that there's something very wrong out there Absolutely. with our workplace. And the, the Jeremy Rifkin thing, you think, particularly? Was oh, a fabulous. Good, I think uh, he's very, opus, yeah. he's, he's brilliant on the subject, I think, especially of technology and the they had the They had the writings that came up from the Philadelphia Inquirer, was it, or something, where there was a... Uh, look, and the New York Times had an article back about 95, 90, a series of articles that were looking at the downsizing, the downsizing. and the trend. Do you remember that That's thing? That's right. I do remember. On? Absolutely. It was so a huge study. I'm wondering if we couldn't get, uh, maybe, uh, maybe we could tick off some of the other sources that you went to as well as your book with some of well, those that, that people uh, you know, I, to. The other, other books that yeah. people would want to take a look at. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to tell you that I can think of that this off the top of my head. No, but I it's think that those white are collar really, sweatshop yeah. is a good place to begin. Thank you. And I do think that what people should also investigate is what's available through the internet. I mean, there's just extraordinary stuff yeah. out there. Checking out often if you do searches on companies' names, if you're thinking about going to work for a company, mm -hmm. I would urge you check out the employee websites because that's a fabulous way of learning what's really going on okay. in these companies. Well, thanks, Jill, very much. Your pleasure to have your perceptions. We'll be coming back again next week. That's it for this particular program. Once again, Jill, thanks very much for coming in, writing Thank the book, you. and for the good work. You have a new book coming out. I do, say. actually, very um, different. It's a personal finance guide for small business owners. Okay. And that's along the lines of uh, free agent nation, or what do you think it's saying? Um, no, no, different. It's a much more practical kind of survival guide, really, a real financial survival guide. For well, people. this is a survival guide on the sociological large-scale pattern for the world system. It seems to me that Thank it's a wake-up call that ought to be heeded, and it's in a, in a very rich uh, sociological and economic reporting tradition. Thank you. I thanks very much, you. Harold. Uh, so we'll see you next time. Thank you for viewing. So it's really... Um, 
good. I love that uh, Jeremy Rifkin. Oh, he's still writing well. He you is, know? absolutely. And he's that, really and a great are. guy. Yeah, he, it's a um, big problem. And huge, I, huge. Uh, really just extraordinary, really. I and think. that that uh, that technological displacement could be a kicker that's really it's the going kicker. To it's really what I think was the kind of that's the the um, weapon that a lot of these companies had really to hold over people's heads because it's the fear that most people have.